Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and help me virtually. Um, I'm a neurologist and a geneticist at Boston Children's Hospital. I, I uh, primarily uh, do research, both basic research and clinical research. Um, and I was invited uh, to come here to talk to you about uh, some novel and unusual trials that we've been running uh, for experimental medicines for orphan diseases. And uh, together with Dr. Larson, who's going to be joining me, we hope to have this conversation with you about the current state of the technology, uh, what's possible today uh, under uh, very uh, specific controlled uh, clinical and research uh, contexts. What are the possibilities of this type of uh, therapeutic intervention and what are the limitations, uh, both in terms of uh, extrapolation and scale. Um, and really, where, wherever you all would like to take myself and Costa in the conversation, we will follow. First, uh, my disclosures. Uh, I have served as ad hoc scientific advisors to uh, three commercial companies and served uh, as a volunteer board member of a number of nonprofits, all in the rare disease space. So, uh, by way of introduction, I am, as I mentioned, a clinically trained as a neurologist, but also uh, a basic science wise, uh, a neurobiologist and geneticist. Uh, this is a recent snapshot of our group, uh, one of the first in person we had together uh, after one a while uh, due to COVID restrictions. Um, and this is a list of the topics that we work in. We've worked uh, for years in the space of human genetics, uh, using the tools of human genetics to understand uh, how the human brain is built, both in normal development and also in disease. Uh, it's diseases and disorders uh, such as human brain malformations have been the subject of our research. Neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism have been another major focus of our work. We do both human genetics and also experimental functional modeling of these conditions uh, in IPS derived neurons and mini brains. We've also done some method development in genomics analysis and interpretation. And putting all of this together, uh, we uh, have in the last five years had a new focus of our lab to take some of these human genetic skills, the neurobiology skills, the neurobiology skills, and put them together to try to deliver an unusual type of genomic medicine. Um, I will introduce or review a paper that we published a few years ago, a few years ago, uh, that um, got a lot of attention. I recognize that it may have crossed some of your desks. In this paper, we described how we were able to go from a genetic diagnosis to modeling a patient's mutation in the dish to developing a individualized therapeutic that was targeting our patient specific mutation, and then actually treat our patient with that with partial success. Um, and this whole project lasted about, uh, about four years, and the time from our first meeting the patient to the first treatment was one year. And uh, that had this received a lot of press, as I mentioned, I will cover the highlights to uh, provide the scientific background for our discussion. Um, first, just how this all started. Uh, unusually, uh, back in January 2017, uh, I was forwarded a Facebook post, not a scientific referral, but off of social media. Uh, I learned through uh, a post that was shared first with my wife and then to me uh, about uh, a family in Colorado with a little girl named Mila. She was age six at the time, and she had just been diagnosed with a really terrible neurodegenerative condition called Parkinson's. And in concert with her clinical team at Colorado Children's, uh, she needed help with whole genome sequencing, and so that was the basis for the post. They were looking for someone to help them with whole genome sequencing to help confirm the diagnosis. Looking through this post, um, I learned more about the story. The family had put up a, uh, a web page describing uh, their child's diagnostic honesty. They described how their six-year-old girl had suffered several years of unusual insidious onset of neurologic symptoms. Um, at first, they were small with a 
and trouble seeing uh, in the light, uh, then beginning to stumble seeing, and then, uh, and, but then at age six, she underwent a severe and not emergency regression, uh, losing her sight, losing her ability to speak, uh, and losing her ability to walk. Her diagnosis, uh, which was uh, worked out and achieved by Dr. Larson, who we here all here from that uh, joined me, um, was uh, something called that disease. Uh, that disease uh, is a family of rare autosomal uh, storage disorders, which uh, especially impact the central nervous system. There are 14 different subtypes. They each lead to progressive neuronal injury affecting the retina and the brain. And they progress to uh, symptoms of vision loss, seizures, motor and cognitive decline. And for this particular subtype of nine disease, which is CLN7 bad disease, uh, the natural history is that children uh, pass away by age 11 or 12, typically. Uh, back in 2017, when this diagnosis was delivered by Austin to this family, uh, there were no active investigational treatments, certainly no updated for new treatments. Uh, and not that many, there was nobody working on a therapeutic strategy. There were a number of folks working on the basic biology, uh, but no active therapeutics uh, at hand. Now, the reason that this had come to us through Facebook was that despite having a clinical diagnosis, which was secure, uh, Dr. Larson Austin had spent uh, appropriate clinical genetic testing to confirm the CLN7 diagnosis and had only found out. This is, uh, like the disorders that are the subject of your uh, conference here, a recessive mutation, uh, a recessive disease. Two mutations are required, one from mom, one from dad, and uh, clinical testing found only a single mutation. <laughs> so in order to be sure of the diagnosis, so that to put the, path, the family on the path of what scientists they need to connect to to try to learn more about this disease, we needed to establish with certainty what the second mutation is. Uh, that's where my lab came in. Our laboratory at that time was not working on therapeutics, but we were working on advanced uh, genome sequencing technologies and algorithms for detecting unusual, difficult to recognize mutations for old genome sequencing. And to cut a long academic story short, we uh, rapidly arranged for whole genome sequencing of this child, thinking that this would be a perfect application of our skill set to try and find a difficult to find mutation. And we found something. We found that this is a small genome sequence from our patient. The top track is our patient Mila, the second track is her mother, the third track is her father. And what I hopefully circled in yellow is a cluster of deep intronic reads uh, that were colored on the screen, I'll explain why. Uh, they were deep within the intron six, and they were colored because our, our genome browser had been set to color reads that are mismapped. What do I mean by that? Well, let's zoom in closer. Uh, these were mismapped reads that, in, sense, in essence, were chimeric. Uh, these were reads in which they were these, uh, these, each of these gray bars represents uh, one uh, snippet of the sequence read going across uh, in a site of something unusual in intron 6. These were hybrid reads or chimeric reads in which uh, most of that green, uh, that gray bar has to be fully clean genome referenced, but then at a sharp demarcation point, uh, became apparently fused to a sequence which didn't belong. Here there were some reads that were fused, uh, that were normal sequence seven sequence reads fused to a stretch of poly T's. Here there were other sequences fused to a stretch of candid and hexaveric repeats. And this the right point between these two were separated by 14 nucleotides. Without going into all of the molecular genetic archaeology of this, um, we managed after several days of staring at the sequence and trying to sketch out different possibilities, including the possibility of chromosomal transportation or other esoteric possibilities, that what was actually occurring in our patient was an intronic uh, insertion. An insertion of a mobile DNA element, about 2,000 2, nucleotides long, that began in sequence on one side with the poly T stretch and ended in sequence on the other side with the hexamere beacon. 
And so what we are looking at in our culture, the judgmental breakpoints, where this instruction can occur. The impact of this instruction of about 2,000 nuclear tires was to change the splicing of this gene and create an exon trap. Exon is six no longer spliced to seven, but now it's spliced into a splice site created by the new insertion. Um, we demonstrated this by our TPCR, uh, confirming the functional deficit and completing the diagnosis. And that um, is a story which is of interest to whole genome sequencers, interest to uh, geneticists who are uh, in, in the business of cataloging unusual, uh, difficult to find mutations. And it might have stopped at that. Except that we were staring at the situation and recognizing this unusual feature of this type of mutation, that these are mutations in which the protein coding sequence is entirely intact. And all that's altered is the topology. The splice site's usage is incorrect. But the existing native splice site and all the remaining protein coding exons are intact. And it made us begin to think is there a way we could devise to treat this? to fix this, to restore proper splicing of this gene by masking this uh, abnormal splicing. So to try to do this, we used the technology that we were reading about at that time, called antisense oligonucleotides. We had no prior experience working with these, although I had read the literature about them and the company was interested in the technology some uh, 10 years prior. And these are short snippets of synthetic uh, DNA or RNA that um, are actually very simple and uh, inexpensive to manufacture. Uh, on a routine basis, we use these to design PCR primers without a single dot, or your primer can have a delivery in a few days. Uh, slightly more sophisticated versions, which is all the nucleotides, have uh, been made in which there are chemical modifications that make them last a long time in the body, that give them a good value distribution, and actually uh, make them quite safe for use in the human body. And Multiple additional modifications have been made to allow these to be used to either boost gene expression by altering gene splicing patterns, as I'll explain in a minute, or in some cases to shut down the genes by binding to RNAs targeting them for destruction. I'm going to be focusing on the former of those, or most of the time. I will give one example of shutting down genes at the end. As I mentioned in 2017, we were reading about this because the New England Journal was reporting a really remarkable result um, for patients with spinal muscular atrophy. These patients uh, were uh, subject to a uh, neuromuscular disease that leads them to lose their respiratory abilities by age one uh, because of the lack of uh, survival factor that keeps motor neurons alive. And we were, like many of you, reading about the drug that was made to combat this condition used to nursing, used to nursing. Is an 18 nucleotide synthetic antisense oligonucleotide given by spinal tap for these engines, it restored normal splicing of the SMN2 gene and had remarkable clinical benefits. And reading about the technology that was used in underlying this nurse, we were impressed that spinal taps given to uh, individuals uh, give rise to drug exposures not just in the spinal cord but also in the cerebellum, the tons, and the cortex. And we were impressed that uh, the cellular type biodistribution was also quite broad. Neurons laid out multiple cell types within the central nervous system on histologic sections, all showed brown stain indicative of their binding to an antibody against the chemically modified backbone of an antisense oligonucleotide. So, spinal tap administration gets broad distribution up and down the axis. And broadly into the cell types. That meant that our effort had some plausibility to it. Well, could we actually make an ASO for our patient's mutation? So uh, we set out to do this and we published, uh, we were successful in doing this. And I'll show you the, the main pieces of uh, data that uh, had to be generated to support that effort. Uh, we had to uh, Complicated interesting in design, and he sent all the nucleotides targeting the abnormal splice site created by our mutation. Uh, not just the mutation itself, but also nearby splice enhancers. Um, all of these multiple mutations have turned out to have proved to be good targets for uh, ASOs. 
We have had a general education cell lines, fiber loss, and we need to believe that IPS cells might be described neurons in which to test these antisensitive nucleotides. Um, and testing using these cells, we're able to devise uh, uh, RT-PCR assays to look at patterns of normal splicing, and splicing, and distinguish which of our designs worked and which ones did not. And we were able to also use RNA sequencing to demonstrate that our lead sequence was able to boost levels of normal splicing from 7 to 11 percent in red to 32 percent in green, representing a three to five fold increase in the amount of normal uh, CN7 gene product. And it did not hurt at all to also have functional corroboration uh, using the known function of this gene product to uh, maintain lysosomal functioning within skin cells. We were able to show that our patient's skin cells, in the absence of any treatment, show the accumulation of that normal storage material within the cytoplasm, and that that accumulation of storage material went away after just 24 hours of treatment with uh, an antisense algorithm attack. Now, thinking about why we were allowed to treat, um, we considered very carefully a number of factors here that uh, made this accelerated effort possible. Uh, it wasn't a light decision we made lightly. This is not a standard clinical trial. We were proposing to treat this inflammation, and, and what are the circumstances under which this makes any sense at all? Um, well, number one, um, this was an orphan and fatal disease. Um, there were no available alternative treatments, and the natural history was very, very clear what, what happened without the treatment. So that meant that the risks of, of understudying the treatment had to be balanced against the risks of doing nothing, which were very, very obvious from the natural history. Number two, we were working with, uh, as you know well, a monitoring disorder, a single gene disorder, uh, with this identified mutation and a scientifically feasible fix, for which we had significant preliminary data in the laboratory. Um, this was really fixing the root cause. And number three, the fact that this was a unique mutation we found in a single patient actually had advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one of the advantages of the FDA sentiment is that the risks incurred in enrolling a patient need to be carefully and exhaustively described to one family. But it is not a broadly marketed trial to many participants in which one is now asking uh, to expose a dozen or two dozen patients to this, uh, this uh, difficult to contact risk. Mechanically, uh, we, well, ethically and medically, we went through those previous questions and convinced ourselves it was appropriate to proceed uh, mechanically, uh, our funding with the FDA was put through under the expanded access funding. Uh, and with that, um, we were able, with the FDA's help, to put together an accelerated campaign to manufacture this drug, to do appropriate animal testing, and to launch a clinical trial. Um, we received permission to proceed with that uh, trial about a year and a week after we first met the patient um, and began treating her. Uh, to be exactly that. And what we published in the journal uh, was our finding that this effort really had clinical effects uh, that exceeded uh, our reasonable expectations. In the sense that we were very fortunate to see uh, signs of uh, clear uh, clinical engagement with the target. This is our patient's seizure frequency. She had 10 to 30 seizures per day in the weeks, 100 days leading up to our trial. Um, as doses were given, the seizure frequency came down from 10 to 30 down to 0 to 10. Uh, the dark colored dots also shifted to light colored dots, indicating that her seizures previously had always lasted greater than one minute, and by uh, a few months after treatment, uh, they were now uh, only lasting a few seconds. If you follow the trace out to the right, um, you see around day 400, we decided to give additional loading doses and to increase the dose uh, by 50%, and the seizure frequency appeared to come down further after that. So this was, uh, at a scientific level, uh, it's seemed uh, a success. Uh, of course, it's a of one, and seizures can uh, sometimes change on you, it's difficult to be 100% certain, but Clinicians who take care of patients with that disease 
all agree that this is a very unusual pattern for seizures to take in patients with that disease. Um, I wish I could say that all the measures of uh, possible clinical outcome measures in a patient uh, worked as well as this. Uh, they did not. Um, despite the improvements in seizures, we did find that brain volume loss did continue in our patient. It had been ongoing for three years before our trial, and it might have slowed, but it did not stop after our trial began. And uh, concomitant with that, she did show slowly, uh, especially in the year two, extended to year three, uh, some neurocognitive decline, so diminished responsiveness. Uh, such that at the beginning of year three, uh, the family with our support made a very difficult decision to uh, change goals of care to palliative and uh, to focus on her comfort. And uh, she passed away just about a year ago uh, now uh, in, in her home. Her family gave us, gave us one last gift, uh, which was permission to perform an autopsy. Um, and we are uh, working through uh, that uh, really uh, remarkable gift right now. It's given us the opportunity to uh, look at tissues, to look at levels of slice recipe, and to confirm, as we had hoped to see, that uh, levels of C17 or LSDA uh, were uh, significantly impacted by the drug in the brain, as shown here, with up to almost 45% uh, normal slice product in the prefrontal cortex um, from this analysis. So um, this uh, paper um, and this story is what has injected a lot of interest into this type of uh, therapeutic approach to this modality. There's been a lot of excitement about this concept of programmable medicines. And here's Mr. Garson on top. Here's Nielsen on the bottom. Um, it's a chemistry that is now been used in about a dozen different human clinical investigational trials. And through this Penraza experience, the dispersion experience, and SMA patients, been given to over 20,000 patients. And can we use this chemistry um, just and apply different sequences to use these drugs to apply them to multiple different locations? And that's what's got a lot of people interested, in including ourselves. Um, first, a word of caution um, that there are many ethical and regulatory considerations around this work. Uh, our paper in the journal is accompanied by editorial by the uh, heads of the FDA, John Woodcock and Peter Marks, talking about the regulatory implications um, and uh, other commentaries that come out appropriately, talking about the high cost of these efforts and really uh, pointing out that these are uh, early stage research investigations that are quite expensive. Um, and so picking cases appropriately so we can learn about as much as possible is paramount. We would posit that this is an important opportunity if approached with the right amount of caution. Um, that exploration of this platform uh, for use as individualized medicine may offer options for orphan diseases that are currently below the threshold uh, that will induce a company to go after a condition. Uh, rare diseases are incredibly challenging from a financial model for companies to go after, and perhaps academics can help uh, advance uh, therapeutic hypotheses with these tools. At the same time, uh, we can also think about these not just as care and therapy, therapy development, uh, but it's also possible that these might be uh, tip of the spear uh, pilot efforts that can provide important proof of concept for other therapeutic efforts to follow. Uh, gene therapy and one-shot cures are certainly uh, a fantastic goal to shoot but perhaps those efforts would be better informed if they were pilot ASO experiments that could validate the genetic target to uh, provide support for a biological hypothesis or to define the clinical therapeutic wonder. Um, then, regardless of how you think about this effort, though, it has to be done in an incredibly thoughtful and systematic fashion, sticking with ASOs of the same capital class and mechanism as much as possible, because we know that. You can't just simply change the sequence and expect everything to behave the same way. Uh, they behave more similarly than any two small molecules, but there are differences. And so trying to minimize those differences by sticking with the same chemistry or mechanism of action is really important. 
We've talked to the FDA about this, about a need for standards, um, and had really productive conversations with them. Uh, we've talked to them and the community about the cautions of this type of work. It's appealing, but deceptively simple, a lot of clinical, scientific, regulatory, ethical hazards that have to be navigated, uh, lots of expectation management that's really important. Um, we've also seen uh, many groups uh, also working in the same vein, um, illustrating just the potential of the technology. Uh, this technology was used to advance and accelerate patient therapy for a patient with a fatal form of ALS. Uh, a year after we spoke publicly about our Nielsen case, so we had the pleasure of working with them and helping with them, and helping them with that. Um, another academic group at the University of Massachusetts uh, advanced another effort for another genetic form of ALS. This one, first one was FUS ALS, the second one was CNR group 72 ALS. And there are many, many other efforts like this that are underway. Um, a broad step back, you know, the features of this, these ASOs which are appealing are the rapid customizability of this platform, the simplicity of manufacturing, the ease of delivery, and this growing record of safety and protection of that safety. At the Children's, uh, we've taken on many more cases, uh, looking to see whether or not this is going to be feasible and whether it can be uh, made to be scalable. Uh, an example is uh, a young child who was accidentally diagnosed with a fatal neurogenetic disorder upon birth. She actually was picked up on the normal screening as having a concern for skin. It turned out she did not have skin. Instead, she had a condition called ataxia mutation, causing progressive cerebellar nerve degeneration. Uh, ABT patients have a subtle and logical abnormalities caused by defects in the theater damage response. That's why. She was flagged as a false positive in uh, the newborn screen. Uh, but unfortunately, the family was left in the situation of having uh, identif been, uh, identified as having a disease for which there are no treatments at birth, um, and she wasn't even symptomatic at the time. The unusual feature, however, of her genetic profile was that one of her mutations could be used at least twice cycle, just like a real estate mutation did. So uh, we uh, performed a sort of screening to rescue her AGM splice defect. Uh, found is that were capable of restoring normal splicing in a dose dependent fashion, showed uh, restoration of cellular DNA damage response kinase pathways, uh, and uh, launched an investigational uh, trial for her um, at age two. It's too soon as the day of this work, so let me move to the next uh, sister project of this. It's too soon to say because most of the major symptoms in this disease really begin to accelerate around age five. She just turned five a few months ago. And so we intervened in this case with several years before a uh, patient was typically diagnosed, uh, nearly asymptomatically. She had some symptoms, but nearly asymptomatically. And so therefore, we're going to have to wait and be patient for another year to read out whether this might have had an impact on her progression. Importantly, uh, many people are probably wondering you know, what fraction of cases out there might be amenable to the splice switching strategy. And it's a small number. Uh, we've taken the opportunity of working with this family and the foundation uh, representing a group of families with AT to look at 235 cases of AT studied by whole genome sequencing. We devised a way to categorize mutations into whether or not they might be eligible for an ASO approach like this. And of these 235 cases, we found that 36 cases, 36 subjects, had at least one variant that could be potentially amenable to this approach. That's 15%. And we think that that's a reasonable guesstimate for the number that we might encounter in other recessive diseases. So I'll put a range on say 10 to 15%. But, uh, and that's an exciting number, it's, it's a substantial number. But a sobering fact is that. Despite there being one recurring variant that showed up in 13 of these subjects, treating all 36 of them would require 23 different ASOs. So, in order for this to work, we're really going to have to put our money or our mouth is in the data. We're going to say this is individualized medicine, we're going to have to get much better at making these individualized medicines. Um, we're going to make the cost of life and the speed of our development is going to have to come way down. I want to wrap up with uh, one last case, a cautionary case. Um, this is a two-year-old with infantile onset epilepsy. 
She is uh, one of a number of patients with a syndrome called epilepsy infancy with migrating foliar seizures. And like other children with this condition, in her first week of life, she began having dozens of seizures during the day that were not responsive to epileptic medications. In her case, uh, which is uh, similar to about half of the cases of uh, infants with this clinical syndrome, she had mutations in a gene called the KCG1 SLAC gene. Hers was an R374H mutation in this sodium gated potassium channel. It's responsible for mediating, uh, uh, modulating the level of excitability. Um, and patients with KCNT1 mutations and this clinical syndrome have a very, very poor prognosis. A series of 17 of these patients showed all of them to suffer severe to profound neurologic impairment. And half of them died at a median age of three years old. We um, know the mechanism of this disease. Mutations in this channel lead to increased currents and hyperexcitability of the neurons. This has been demonstrated in frog experiments, in patient IPSC derived neuronal experiments, in mouse. Um, it's a well understood mechanism of action. And it leads to a very plausible therapeutic hypothesis, which is to knock down the mutated gene, which creates a leaky channel. Um, and makes neurons hyperexcitable. It turns out that you're better off with, uh, with half of this gene or even none of this gene than you would be if you had the leaky version of this gene. And so, cutting short a lot of hard work, uh, our team developed over about a year and a half uh, an ASO strategy to knock down KCT1 in patient cell lines, in uh, transformed cell lines, in patient neurons, and then in mice, did safety studies and got permission from the FDA to, um, to initiate experimental therapy for two patients who had the most severe mutation known in this disorder, uh, an R for or H mutation. Um, of those that have been experimentally characterized, this is by far the worst and most toxic of mutations. And just by way of illustration again of, of um, promise and pitfalls, I'll show you um, a chart of how we number patients did. Um, here is uh, our patient showing seizure frequency on the y-axis, again, like in the Mises project. Doses in the orange stars, uh, again, like the Mises graph. And you can see that she was out between 5 and 20 seizures per day in the running period before the trial. Then um, a dose was given, a second dose was given, a third and a fourth dose, 10 to 20, 30, 40 milligrams. And after the 40 milligram dose, we saw a remarkable thing. We saw her seizures plummet to zero for nearly 50 days. And then you see that her seizures gradually came back, um, with giving us a very strong on and off response as the drug decayed even more off. You are probably asking, why did we stop if we got seizures to go down to zero? Um, and that is because in this patient, we also encountered a serious adverse event. Uh, after the fourth dose, we began to detect ventricular enlargement. Um, and this enlargement um, was progressive in a patient with a very poor neurologic exam the baseline, difficult to monitor whether or not it would progress on, by clinical measures alone. So we had to place a, a neurosurgical ventricular arterial stunt to, uh, as a safety valve to relieve uh, her from uh, any potential pressure buildup in the brain. Uh, and this was uh, obviously uh, a not a fun experience for anybody involved, uh, uh, at least it from the parents and, and our patient. Um, and that's why we have for purposes. Now, without going into the, well, be reporting many more details of this program uh, in the fall, but just I, I share this to point out both on the one hand promise, but also as a cautionary note, uh, that this type of effort is when you take it very seriously, and that uh, even though the safety profile of ASOs, there's growing information about them, there's the opportunity, opportunity to learn, unfortunately, uh, new toxicities. And so we'll have to watch this in the way risk and benefits uh, every step of the way. Um, by the way, for this particular patient, um, weighing the risk of continued treatment plus uh, the prognosis that she has, 
um, we are considering the dose reduction and restarting the trial uh, with careful monitoring. Uh, but just uh, be aware that this uh, type of thing uh, can happen. So I'm going to stop there um, and uh, thank the, the many people who have been involved in this work. My lab members, my colleagues at Boston Children's, but also well beyond. Lots of stakeholders, um, including at the NIH, the FDA, um, and academic institutes, uh, ethics centers, uh, the Trans Echo Initiative. Um, this is a pretty wide range of uh, topic that requires lots of conversation. The FDA, in particular, has set out a series of guidances um, that uh, reinforce the template that we set forth in the Nielsen Project and um, give guidance, official guidance, on paper for others to review. Uh, thank you so much. I mentioned people's names involved in the project throughout. So I will stop there and uh, move on to the next uh, project. All right. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so we're going to switch PowerPoints here for a minute. And uh, I will uh, give you a little bit of a different perspective. So, his uh, name is Austin Larson. Well, he's a pediatrician, he's a medical geneticist, he's a medical geneticist, he's uh, a faculty at the University of Colorado, and practice at Children's Hospital of Colorado. And I'm primarily a clinician, uh, but I have had the good fortune of collaborating with him on a couple of cases uh, for which uh, the case has been amenable to the type of antisense oligonucleotide customized therapy that uh, Tim described so eloquently. So what I would like to do with my talk is to kind of ground this in the experience of being a clinician and taking care of patients with very rare diseases, thinking about through the diagnostic process as we get genetic results, as we define these illnesses, as we get imaging studies, uh, other types of evaluations of these patients, what are the characteristics that might make a case appropriate for this approach? And how do I think through that on a case-by-case -case basis as a clinician? The other thing I'd like to do with this talk is to then uh, use what I've learned today, so that um, there's been a, a lot of really great information about paroxysmal diseases. Um, I've gotten a lot out of being in this room today. And so I'm going to try to uh, identify some specific uh, characteristics of the diseases that you all have talked about that might be relevant for this approach. So as part of my job as a clinician for patients with rare diseases in the metabolic field, I am a site uh, PI for uh, trials with a number of industry sponsors. So. These are my disclosures, and also on the uh, Scientific and Medical Advisory Award for the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. So, uh, as I said, I'm going to take you through one case in particular uh, in which we identify that the case might be particularly amenable to this strategy, uh, specifically a splice switching antisense oligonucleotide. And then we'll talk about the commonalities between that case and that uh, category of diseases and the commonalities that that has with uh, proximal biogenesis disorders. And then at the end of the talk, I'd like to kind of expand that, maybe plant some seeds for a discussion. We have a pretty long time set aside to discuss this, uh, this therapeutic platform uh, and think about how this might in the context of other therapeutic approaches that we're, that we're all thinking about. So this is a patient that I met about five years ago. She was five years old at that time. She had typical cognitive skills, but her primary presentation was auto-amputation of the distal fingers. So, it was apparent by the time she was about two years old that she had no sensation at all in her fingers or toes. And as a result, she was uh, unintentionally causing serious injury to her digits. Uh, this is a picture of her hand. 
And in addition to that, it became apparent a couple years later that she had slowly progressive loss of vision, starting with her night vision. By the time she was five years old, she had 2150 vision in one eye, 2250 vision in the contralateral eye. She had an electroreticogram, and it was confirmed that she had minimal electrical activity of the retina in response to visual stimuli. And so we initially uh, had some clinical testing that was not fully diagnostic, and then we were able to do whole genome sequencing and arrive at a diagnosis. So this is a picture of her electroretinogram. Uh, the black arrows indicate when there's a, a visual stimulus given, and you can see that there was no electrical activity resulting from those visual stimuli, indicating severe uh, retinal disease. The image on the left isn't coming through very well, but you can see at the periphery of the retina, there's black pigmentation kind of modeled around the uh, red cells of the retina that indicates degeneration of the retina. So the initial evaluation of this patient, this is uh, kind of similar to Mila. This is a patient with a pretty specific phenotype. So there are not many conditions that cause congenital insensitivity to pain and progressive retinopathy. In a uh, gene panel, so remember this was like 2015, so a gene panel was um, kind of what, what we had available at the time. And we found that there was one rare variant in a gene called FLVCR1. I'll go into some details about that gene. It's probably not a gene that you all are familiar with, or maybe you are. Um, so that was a pretty good phenotypic match, but it was, again, it was a recessive disease, and we only had identified a single mutation. So this gets back to the scenario that um, uh, Anthony Chung and Dr. Braverman presented. When you, as a clinician, have a very clear phenotype, you, you have a, a good sense of the category of disease that a patient has, there can be significant value in looking for those unusual second mutations or unusual first mutations if you're not able to get a clear and complete genetic diagnosis. So at that time, the diagnostic considerations were maybe we're missing something, maybe there's another gene that's responsible for this, or maybe there's a non-coding regulatory region, neutronic mutation in the other allele of FLPCR1. So this patient was able to get whole genome sequencing on a research basis and accomplish both of those goals, both look for other possible diagnoses and to also interrogate those intronic and regulatory regions to see if there was a second hit in the FLBCR1 gene. So this whole genome sequencing was initially done by a company called Xenon Pharmaceuticals. They had a congenital insensitivity to pain research study for whole genome sequencing. And uh, Bo Zhao, who's in uh, Tim Yu's lab, um, was able to, to look at the data that was generated from that study. And they were also able to independently uh, confirm, resequence, confirm, and, and validate the diagnosis which is actually a very similar mechanism to what Tim presented for Mila, with one slight variation. So if you look at the sequence here, uh, what you see is uh, not a transposon itself in the intron of FLVCR1, but this is what's called a processed pseudogene. So it's essentially the cDNA uh, from a, an adjacent gene that was inserted using the mechanisms, or the, the transposons kind of cut and paste genomic capabilities, it inserted that process pseudogene into the intron of FLVCR1. So uh, that was pretty compelling as a second hit and as uh, evidence that we had a clear genetic diagnosis for this patient. So the disease that's associated with FLBCR1 is called posterior column ataxia with retinitis pigmentosa, or PCARP. 
So this is a disease that has about 25 cases in the literature. So this is an ultra-rare disease on par with many of the proximal diseases that we've been talking about today. But it is a disease that has very clear phenotypic associations. So all of the patients with this disease have one or more of retinitis pigmentosa, congenital neuropathy, and posterior polymetaxia. Of those patients that have retinitis pigmentosa, that has been progressive for all of them. So once, the, once there has been evidence of retinopathy that has been progressive over the course of years, resulting in uh, complete blindness for those patients that have gotten to adulthood. So uh, Bo and Tim uh, did RNA sequencing. They were able to show that this processed pseudogene in the intron of FLBCR1 was acting just like that SVA transposon was for Mila. So it had a splice acceptor, and uh, the splicing was um, happening into the middle of that intron and uh, resulting in nonsense mediated decay. So at this point, this was one year after uh, Tim had started the process of developing a custom ASO for Mila, I mentioned to Tim, hey, I have a, a really similar case to our last one, and it has some of the characteristics, even typically, that we've talked about as being potentially a, a relevant scenario in which a custom ASO might be a viable option. So the questions that I'm asking myself as a clinician in this scenario are starting at the level of mutation, is the genetic mechanism potentially amenable to a custom ASO approach? So the two types of uh, custom ASOs that Tim talked about were a splice switching approach or an allele specific knockdown approach. In this case, uh, we have that splice acceptor in the intron. If we can block that splice acceptor, restore normal splicing, the entire protein coding region is intact and could potentially result in uh, functional protein. So then the second question is, are there important manifestations of this disease that are caused by dysfunction of an organ that be uh, targeting with an ASO. So Tim talked about brain cases. In this case, we're starting to think about using it intraocularly uh, for retinal delivery of the ASO. And that is, of course, potentially relevant to proxomal disease. There are some newer chemistries of antisense oligonucleotides that can target other organs. So the liver and kidney uh, may now be uh, targetable as the modifications to the ASO. And then a really important question one is, if we partially restore expression of the wild type allele in an ASO amenable tissue at the point, at this point in the disease, is that going to change the natural history of the disease in a meaningful way? So, you know, I, when I talk to patients about uh, their conditions, I talk about primary progressive processes and secondary progression of disease. So uh, some diseases, and, and Tim mentioned the, the idea of the therapeutic window, when do you have an opportunity to intervene? So there are some conditions where, um, so for example, in uh, mitochondrial disease, I care for a lot of patients with Lee syndrome. So Lee syndrome is a basal ganglia injury that occurs early in life. Sometimes it's progressive, sometimes there are additional basal ganglia injuries or other brain injuries, but oftentimes it's not progressive. That said, that initial brain injury is irreversible, and there are secondary progressions of symptoms. So the fact that that injury occurred and is irreversible means that over time, things like scoliosis, feeding intolerance, uh, skeletal manifestations, those are all secondary manifestations of the irreversible brain injury. That's not the primary progression of the disease. So if you're thinking about restoring 
expression of the wild type allele, are you going to change the natural history of the disease? It depends on whether the progression of the disease is related to the primary mechanism or is the progression secondary. So the discussion I had with this family was that this patient has a progressive process. It's part of the primary progression of her disease. Uh, so it is the, the lack of the FLDCR1 expression in her retina that is causing a progressive process whereby she's losing her vision. Not only is she losing her vision, but she has no sensation either. So this is a patient with ataxia and neuropathy. She is uniquely dependent on her visual input to navigate the world. And so uh, thinking about the risks and benefits of a novel therapy, the benefits for her are much larger than for someone who doesn't have the concomitant neuropathy and ataxia. This mechanism is one of the mechanisms that's most amenable to a custom ASO. It's a deep entropic mutation, so you have a lot of uh, latitude in terms of how you design the ASO. There's a, a lot of area that you can land the ASO in and potentially alter slicing. The other unique aspect of eye diseases is that, unlike the brain, where you're giving an intrathecal injection and you only have one brain, so you're treating the entire brain, in the case of an ocular disease, the two eyes are isolated from one another. You can inject one eye and you can see, are you getting, is it safe? Are you uh, causing any harm by injecting that one eye? And are you seeing any evidence of efficacy before you decide to then treat the contralateral eye. So the trial design can be different. And in the setting of an ocular disease, that actually lowers the risk, the fact that you can treat one eye first. For this patient, for the reasons that I talked about, uh, slowing or stopping the progression of her retinal disease would have a, a meaningful impact on her quality of life. And it would be worth taking some risk to potentially halt the progression of her retinopathy. We do know that there's a class effect of injecting antisyntolagonucleotides into the eye, which is that they can cause cataracts. That is a class effect as opposed to a sequence-specific effect. And in talking about how generalizable this paradigm is, it's important to differentiate between sequence-specific side effects versus class effects. So having had this discussion, the family asked us to try to proceed and see if we could develop a custom antisensorial nucleotide. So Bo, uh, in Tim's lab, um, started to design antisensorial nucleotides and test them for efficacy in the cultured fibroblast for this patient, and later in um, IPSC neurons. So in fibroblasts, um, you can see that uh, there was some restoration of the normal transcript of the gene with some of the ASOs. Um, at least two of the ASOs were increasing wild type transcript at pharmacologically relevant doses. Um, this is the same type of uh, readout that Tim showed you earlier, where um, with RNA sequencing, we're seeing a, a significant increase in the amount of wild type transcript. There's also a scientist in Italy named Deborah Chiarando who studies FLBCR1, and she's a, an expert in this uh, protein. She was able to show a, an increased expression of the wild type FLDCR1 protein in patient fibroblasts with the lead ASO compound. And so at that point, we had a viable lead compound, and we elected to collaborate with an entity called NLORM. So NLORM is a spin-off from a drug company called Ionis, and NLORM uh, has a process whereby they accept cases that are potentially amenable to custom antisense oligonucleotides, and uh, they will perform uh, certain aspects of the development process. In this case, uh, this is a uh, three-party collaboration. So um, the group at Enlorum is working on optimizing the ASO, 
doing the uh, manufacturing and doing animal toxicity studies. At Children's Hospital of Colorado, um, we have uh, done the clinical trial design. Um, Boston Children's is doing the IND application, and we're all working on institutional agreements between the three parties to make this work. So the timeline for this case is a little bit slower than what Tim described. Um, so the genetic diagnosis for this patient was in 2016. 2019 was the start of functional studies and the ASO design. And we just had a meeting about this this morning. So um, the animal toxicity studies are concluding in the next month or two. Uh, and the IND application will be submitted in the next couple months. We hope to treat the patient this fall. So what's the relevance for this community here? Uh, well, proximal biogenesis disorders have specific phenotypes with established natural histories. A lot of the work that you've heard about today is really important for establishing this. And the better that the natural history is defined, the more viable it is to do an N of 1 clinical trial design. Because if you're doing an N of 1 trial design, other than in ocular disease where you can treat one eye and not the other, but if you're treating the brain, the only comparator that you have is the known natural history of that disease. Dr. Raymond presented some gain of function mechanisms this morning, so some new mechanisms of disease that we're learning about. We heard about um, ACOX1 gain of function. So that would be relevant for the other type. Instead of the splice switching custom antisensor organonucleotide, that would be relevant for the allele specific knockdown, where haploid sufficiency is a preferable state to the, the toxic gene function allele. In paroxysmal disease, we have established biomarkers. So while we really care about the clinical outcomes, the biomarkers are really, really useful as well to follow the course of the disease. There's a community of researchers with animal models and in vitro models. So the more animal models, the more cell models there are, the more viable it is to do the early stages of development. If there's a cell model that's really well characterized and it's sitting there in the lab and you can apply a potential custom antisensor nucleotide to it, that really accelerates the ability to do this. Or if there's a mouse model that is available, um, again, that's, that's an even higher level of, of proof. Uh, as we can continue to establish the genetic basis and look for these rare and unusual mutations, look for these gain of function mechanisms, these intronic and regulatory mutations, those are the mutations that are going to be most amenable to this approach. So, as Tim said, this is going to be maybe 10 or 15 percent of all mutations might have some of these ASO amenable uh, mechanisms. We also have a set of unfortunately progressive diseases, but from the perspective of a potential antisense oligonucleotide, it only makes sense to treat if the ongoing progression of disease is related to the primary mechanism of the disease. And that's why it's so important for people like you all to truly understand these diseases at the mechanistic level, at the genetic level, at the protein level, at the level of the organelle, of the cell, of the tissue, of the whole organism. So Tim talked about this a bit, and this will, I want to bring this up in your mind again uh, as we move into the discussion now with, with Tim and myself. How could this possibly be scalable and sustainable? These are N of 1 cases. There are immense resources that went into the cases that you heard about today. So how could we possibly get to the point where this would be relevant for a, a broader cross-section of the rare disease community? Well, we have to continue to clarify what are class effects versus sequence specific toxicity. So the, the um, hydrocephalus that Tim presented, that needs to be characterized. Um, we need to validate model systems for the sequence specific tox toxicity. And so those model systems can be in silico, they can be in vitro, they can be animal models, but the more that we can uh, use these models recurrently, the more uh, certainty we can have that they're giving us a valid evaluation of toxicity. We need to establish a toolkit or a template clinical trial design so that there's more of a plug and play aspect. If you have a patient with retinopathy 
here's a trial designed to consider. You need to modify that for the specific circumstances, but you don't need to start from scratch. And Tim has done a lot of work, and a lot of other folks have done work on streamlining the regulatory pathway, both at the level of uh, governmental institutions, but also uh, hospitals and universities. So to lay the groundwork for both custom antisensor gonucleotides and any new therapies, we need to understand these mechanisms as well as possible. We need to have a really nuanced uh, idea of how, how these diseases work. Uh, these model systems need to be readily accessible, and the natural history needs to be as clear as, as we can make it. With genotype phenotype correlations, the natural history of the different biomarkers, the significance of those biomarkers as it relates to severity of disease. And we need many irons in the fire. So this is just one approach. It's really, it's a minority of cases that will be amenable to this approach. And there's lots of other really good and really exciting therapeutic avenues. So things like new small molecules, gene replacement, repurposing of existing drugs, and lots of other potential therapies. So I want to acknowledge the folks uh, at Boston Children's who've been great collaborators. Um, and the folks at my own institution as well that have worked on this case. And we're gonna open things up now for a discussion. So if you can um, maybe bring Tim back up on the screen uh, and then we can talk through this. Where's my thank you both. Hi Tim, this is Michael Walker from the Daily College of Medicine. Um, I wanted to ask when it's important to know for instance, maybe the loss of function phenotype or the deletion phenotype for toxicity, because it seems like a lot of these oligos are really specific for one allele, but still I see coming into the conversation a discussion of like whether there would, you know, whether it's okay to have a loss of this gene or a decrease in the transcript. So I don't understand how to think how you all think about. Thanks, so, uh, Austin. Do you have a preference? So I'm going to take this one first, and you want to have a second? Go for it. So, uh, Mike, that's a very important, that's a very important question. And, and so, even actually before I address it, it's, it's a really important question. Uh, I would say that there is a really simple case where this question doesn't have to come into the picture. The Nielsen case and the FLPCR1 case, uh, these are obviously the recessive plastic function diseases, and they're using splice modulation to restore some function, uh, some normal gene products to a cell which presumably have a, uh, insufficient quantities. So we don't have to worry about that problem. Uh, we're just trying to restore a small amount. But for the knockdown therapies, uh, knockdown therapies, this is an absolutely critical question. Let me first start with the example that we described, and then there are other examples that, that, that people probably know really well too. But in our particular example, the KCMT1 example, I described how a single dominant mutation, a single mutation, mutation just one copy of the GCT1 gene can lead to excess current influx and uh, increased neural network excitability. And um, it was really important, uh, and I took these slides out for time, but it was really important for us to look uh, at the, uh, well, the PDLI scores, the constraint scores for the KCMT1 gene. And many of you know what that is, and many of you are wondering what that term means. Basically, what, 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 do, what it's important to ask whether or not the gene that you're talking about now is essential for, for human health and wealth. Um, in the case of a case anti one, if you look inside a research database of patients who have had whole genome sequencing, you can find that there are a number of patients who enrolled in those studies in whom you find a mutation that completely kills one the copy of the case one gene. So you're missing one entire copy that's a non-sense mutation with a frame shooting mutation somewhere. Um, and yet they're also out there and able to enroll in a research study and uh, participate uh, in this database um, that indicates that that gene uh, is not constrained. It's possible to miss 50% of your dosage of that gene completely and you're fine. Uh, so Mike, we did look at that uh, and uh, the PCNT1 is not constrained at all in the heterocytic state. 
What about the host site is stable? The problem is the internet and the existing the genome databases aren't large enough yet to be able to speak with statistical certainty about um, whether there's under or over representation of uh, double markets of uh, where you use both copies. But there we at least we look at the mouse. Um, in mice, they mark out the case into one gene, not get the case into one gene completely, both copies. Actually, it leaves uh, with you with a mouse which is nearly a large thing. It has minor anxiety and uh, very specific learning de deficits in very specific contexts. Uh, that it uh, lives, it raises children, it, 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 uh, it behaves, it, it does many of the normal without mass behaviors. Um, and that was relatively reassuring uh, because we thought we knew that, uh, um, that complete genetic relation is tolerated. All of that being said, you still don't take the risk of being over to patient because genetic mutations um, are, exist since you typically as, uh, from embryo uh, throughout the, the lifespan of the organism um, and uh, patients may uh, in patients you may be eliciting a more acute production of the gene target and that could have a consequence that, that isn't appreciated from genetics um, so uh, there is that Suppose we sort of uh, screen through our, you know, mutation database for 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 mainly, for mainly our autosomal recessive disorders, and identify, you know, perhaps we might identify some splicing alleles. Um, where where like how do you recommend we get started? Are there bioinformatic tools that could help us like do what Austin did, and then, and then you move on to RNA work, and then we email you, or you know, sort of how do you? How do you see the process? Yeah, so uh, we went, uh, Austin mentioned that one collaborative, that, um, and uh, I had, I didn't talk about it, but uh, it had been a little more slides. Um, we are um, hoping to kind of distribute uh, both algorithms, uh, eventually algorithms, but for now, just at least guidelines for what types of uh, how to identify uh, mutations that. Uh, uh, have this type of game splice pattern that they will not alter the ASO. Um, and um, we are, uh, for the moment, we have, uh, we're, we're actually, um, we have a paper that's in the review describing that logic that I mentioned for, for AT use that test case. Um, and happy to send that to you, Mike. Um, and we're also just doing them a collaborative to help you put uh, uh, more of these rules out into the community so it's sort of clear to everybody. Um, uh, what to look for. I have a question about the um, risk of cataracts caused by ASO. Is it really the ASO or is it the technique? I assume it's an intravitreal injection, is that right? So, um, and, and the follow on is sort of how are they delivered? Is it a, a lipid nanoparticle? So, is it really the physical technique or the ASO itself, or what is the risk there um, for the cataract? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, uh, one of the, one of the, the uh, advantages of uh, contemplating who introduced mitral ASO injection is that, um, that it doesn't require a nanoparticle, uh, it doesn't require a virus or any other factor. Um, actually, it's the, 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 what gets injected is actually just the uh, naked all of the nucleotide dissolved in the blood. Um, so, um, whether that means that the cataracts are a response to the needle injection or to the salt in the buffer or uh, or to the uh, you know, repeated administration of sort of uh, I, I actually don't know. I could, uh, we'd have to ask uh, Emily and Austin this, but, uh, but uh, it appears to be uh, an effect. My understanding is that it's an effect of the antisensitive kind of Yeah, that's my understanding as well. Um, the calculus in terms of risk benefit is that um, retinopathy is permanent and irreversible, and cataracts can be treated with a relatively minor surgery. So um, even, if, even though it very likely is a fairly common adverse event, it's uh, probably favorable in the risk-benefit sense. Yeah, 
Uh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Catherine from McGill University. Uh, the follow-on, I guess, so it's a, it's a naked uh, oligo that's being delivered. What tissue types or organ systems could be targeted that like where um, where can you reach? Where is it stable enough to reach? Obviously, CSF and uh, intraocular. Anything else? So the oligonucleotide uh, field is actually uh, always constantly coming up with new ways to contribute to ASO to deliver like different tissues. Um, I'd say that at the moment, uh, intrafecal antisynthetic nucleotides uh, are uh, going to the central nervous system or going to the eye uh, are the spaces where there's the most data. Uh, I'd say that there's also really uh, maybe step slightly below that. Uh, there are, are really clever ways of targeting against all the nucleotides to the liver by conjugating to, uh, to something called GALNAC. Uh, putting a GALNAC in the way to make sense all the nucleotide um, makes it uh, aptly taken up by the liver. Um, you can get very small amounts of it that all ends up in that organ. Um, and that is also a very promising modality that has uh, been in human trials. Um, there are, there's lots of other places that are working on innovative technologies to get them to other places. I know that there are some approaches that are getting it into the lungs. Um, there's a, uh, an antibody conjugated antisensitive type of nuclear system that will grow the muscle for conditions like mitotic dystrophy or Duchenne's uh, or things like that. Um, and I even said there's even something in the literature about targeting pancreatic islet cells. Um, for the moment, brain, eye, liver are the places where there's the most experience and where we can probably move the fastest right now. Yes, hi to Timothy, it's nice to bring you in. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Um, I have just a few questions. Um, so when we were talking about uh, knocking down the gain of function mutation, I just want to make a point that in the diseases we are talking about, there are typically recessive disorders in which we have loss of function, where these are unusual mutations in which we have a single mutation that causes a gain of function. So we could, from following your reasoning, we could knock that down because we know at least at a het the heterozygous loss of function would be uh, a carrier and which should be normal for this. But, but, but more than a, a complete knockdown of this uh, gene, these genes would clearly be, bring us back to the deficiency disease, which is just as severe. Is that, would that be correct thinking that this might be a good approach in this case? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. That's, yeah. um, if, if that unusual dominant mutation is causing either uh, hyperactive or a dominant negative or some sort of new activity, uh, new morphic activity, then uh, allele specific knockdown of that allele uh, is a really good strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and right, you, you should be around the 50% gene function. In reality, allele specific knockdown is never perfectly specific. So you, you might incur a little bit of knockdown of the other copy, the, the non terrible copy. Uh, but for a recessive disorder, it, it seems to be generally in the rule that you can uh, you begin in the absence of only a very, very, very low amounts. So if you went from 50% gene function down to 40% or 30%, um, yeah. I would defer to you, but in any case, that seems to be talking to mm -hmm. And my next question follows up on that is uh, what uh, is the uh, strategy that you use to knock down a, a, a transcription of a gene? Where do you put those all of those? Uh, where do you target them? So, um, I, I will caution that the knockdown is a lot less simple than splice modulation. Uh, splice modulation, um, again, we have never worked yeah, experimentally with antisensitive nucleotides before, and we were able to do it quite quickly. Um, but uh, knockdown requires a significantly larger investment uh, effort. Uh, the ASOs can be placed anywhere on the MRH market. Uh, the, the mechanism of action is that. Uh, and sent out a nucleotide typically between nucleotides that binds to the uh, pre mRNA, uh, and then it's got a stretch in the middle of the antisensitive nucleotide 
that this baby can make, and then the wings with an ancillary molecule are modified to so, uh, chemical modifications. Having that central core of DNA creates an RNA DNA hybrid where it is bound to the mRNA, and then it leads to cleavage of the target. Um, those targets can be in theory or empirically helped to actually, uh, and you end up scanning really the entire, uh, you can scan dozens to hundreds to even thousands of locations of the chain to find sites that are, that are amenable to this type of knockdown. Because it turns out that you can't randomly place it anywhere in the RNA to expect it to work. The problem is that you can't predict where it will work. So you have to actually do quite large screens to look and survey a lot of the, a lot of the territory. Exons, introns, uh, UTRs. Um, we just grab as much as we can and then do, uh, do screens to find out what works and then we can back. And, and so, in the same vein, could you target ASOs to stabilize a transcript? Because we have examples of, um, di of uh, disorders here where there are hypomobiles, and we actually have evidence. Patients with two hypomorphic alleles who do better than patients with one hypomorphic allele and the other one is no. So we reason that if you have more of the hypomorphic protein, you will have more residual function. So could you stabilize those transfers? Yes, yes, you can. Um, and this is uh, really an excellent strategy. In a way, actually, this is how stabilizing the various person works. Yeah, but, um, uh, the target for stabilizing is less than two. And uh, the problem with SMN2, SMN2 is in theory a fully functioning backup copy of SMN1 that we all have in our genomes, except it's uh, missing exon 7. Exon 7 is not included because when it is evolutionarily duplicated to make SMN2, uh, it acquired a bug mutation that led to exon 7 not being incorporated. Um, so, what Spinalazin actually is doing is that it's boosting. Uh, it's actually fixing this lysine pattern of SMN2 to make it work again. Um, it turns out that there are naturally occurring mutations that are present in our genomes that have uh, effects like that for a whole host of genes. Um, there are genes in our uh, there are genes in the genome that are subject to evolutionally acquired inefficiencies of RNA splicing that might lead to the incorporation of post axons. Uh, like real estate or, or uh, that will be certain case that Austin described, where they actually might lead to exons being skipped entirely like in SMN2. If you use an ASO to restore and correct that inefficiency, you can effectively get uh, more productive transcripts to be made and effectively boost the expression of the gene. But in the cases I'm thinking of, if there are fields that are hypomorphic, so it's not as same situation. Um, and uh, the idea would be to enable more transcript so that it would be more protein. I guess you would need to know the protein, the control of protein level too. Because what we want well, is more protein. Well, I, I, what I would suggest there is that instead of targeting the specific mismatch mutation that's causing that, um, we would simply look at the data in the gene to see if there's a pre existing condition, a pre existing inefficiency that is present in how that gene is processed. And um, if one can fix that, it will, uh, if you can design a way to fix that, it won't be specific to that mutation, it will just boost the efficiency of transcription and splicing of that gene itself overall. It will boost the levels of the raw type copy, it will boost the levels of the mid sense copy, uh, rising type will lift both those, and hopefully, uh, you know, assuming that there isn't, as you say, something actually control the amount of total protein that the cell is able to, to manufacture and use it at the point, then that could lead to uh, that could lead to the management. Uh, this is Dr. Clover from uh, Amsterdam University. I was wondering about the hydrocephalus. Um, if it's known how the development of the hydrocephalus was related to the ASO administration, so whether it was communicating due to absorption or maybe not communicating due to high viscosity or something? Right, good question. It was a communicating hydrocephalus. And a few sporadic cases of hydrocephalus have been reported in the Spinrazi culture too, but we really managed to be aware of 
not the bugs, or it could be just normal background and estimations. However, um, we do believe that this is related to the drug because um, ventricular enlargement was seen in adults who received very high doses of an ASDO or a Huntington's trial also. Um, so we think that it's probably dose dependent. It is likely some uh, sequence dependent, not everybody gets it. Um, but I think my hypothesis is that it is uh, related to the ASDO itself. As to, as, as to how it's actually happening, it is going to communicate with hydrocephalus, suggesting that it's a, uh, something impacting the absorption of CSF rather than juice. And we don't understand it yet, we don't have the metrics. But our working hypothesis is that it has to do with some sort of low grade mechanical irritation of the meninges leading to inflammation. Um, and just thinking about how uh, babies with intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, or meningitis, inflammation, scarring of uh, either irritating blood products or infections can lead to hydrocephalus. Um, we're thinking that this might be a uh, low grade uh, chemical meningitis uh, that might be occurring if you give certain ASO drugs too high to the test. Okay, thank you. thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Austin. Thank you.